That's what happens. See, there's, I call it a bending of time. I hope this makes sense to you. I, don't, I haven't really gotten all the language down yet. But uh, one example is Chuck Pierce, actually, of how when you're in that zone and you're operating in the full calling, it's obvious to other people. So if you've been tracking at all with any of the videos we've been posting over the last maybe 18 months, he started talking about plague-like conditions in the fall of 2019. I mean, there's actually one word that came even a year before that in Chattanooga, Tennessee, and, and said it's going to be like a civil war almost going on, right? Like it sounded like it was so dire and negative and people didn't like it, but like, you know, he wrote a book, The Future War of the Church. People don't like hearing about warfare, but he's just doing what the Lord is showing him. The point is that he gets more done in a week than many other people get done in a month. <laughs> really true. Trisha travels with him all over the world as one of the prayer ministers on his team. So, like, up close, you can see uh, who you're dealing with here. It's somebody who's operating almost in a different realm because they're so much more productive. But any of us can achieve more productivity, if we call it that, in the kingdom by being in this place of his governance over every aspect of our life. And that's what he is, Chuck. He's surrendered to God. He's like, I don't always know what I'm, people want me to interpret what, what the prophecy means. He's like, I don't know. I hear what he says and I say it. And then it's up to y'all to try to figure that part out too. Don't ask me to do everything. <laughs> And like Dutch Sheets would say, we go to these conferences, and Dutch Sheets was a professor at Christ for the Nations. He was actually the head of the whole college. So he's very used to, you know, very systematic teaching and having an outline and finishing on time and all this. And Chuck says, you're not allowed to prepare a message in advance. They went to 50 states. And he said, you, you've got to only say what the Lord tells you to say when you get up to preach. Now, this guy had a wealth of... Bible knowledge in his brain, but he wasn't used to that. So Chuck would give him a word 15 minutes before the service starts. The Lord is saying you should speak on this. And Dutch would go, well, what does that mean? And Chuck would say, I don't know. That's your job. you got to figure that out. So like, they're being worship, and he's not getting the answer yet. So he's going to the band like, you know, keep playing. And they think he really likes their music, and he's like, no. I just don't know what to say yet. <laughs> you see, this is very real. There's a, a piece of that on our uh, YouTube channel. It's called Preach from the River. And, and one of the prophets from Alaska spoke to him at one of these meetings and said, oh, Dutch, God is going to show you how to preach from the river. Meaning he was too tied to his outline. And he wasn't allowing the flow of Holy Spirit. He had so much of a deposit. He'd never be at a lack for things to say, but the way he was conditioned was through an outline and through a curriculum and having to test people in school. But there's this other whole side of Christianity that God's saying, I trust you enough with my word that you can listen to my spirit. And that's when you'll start to operate at a higher level of my domain. You won't have to spend 18 hours putting all your slides together and then just be so rigidly locked into that. That's not a bad model, but God has a greater prophetic model. So the point I said to Chuck was like, you, you're bending time in a way. I don't mean that to sound new agey. It's like, but you're taking what would normally take 40 hours and you're getting it done in 10 hours. Because you're such, you're so true to the call that God puts you on your life. And that sets the bar high for the rest of us, doesn't it? And, and the thing he would tell you very humbly, uh, anybody who knows him, he's not a puffed up guy at all, is um, all I'm doing is hearing what the Lord says. See something, say something, right? And because that's all he's done and not worried about so much about keeping everybody happy all the time and being a man pleaser, he's somebody we can look up to and say, wow, that's a great model for a leader. And, uh, we're going to be talking to him just as an aside about his latest book. It's called The Passover Prophecies. I would really highly recommend you get it. It's on audiobook, which is one of the first ones I think that he's got on audiobook. It's four and a half hours on an audiobook, so you can get through it pretty quickly while you're doing other things. You could be listening and then go back and check the scriptures and all. And 
it's, it's, in some ways, it tracks exactly what I was talking about earlier, where he started making these prophecies about what was going to happen by Passover of 2020, but he started two years before that. And it just, he puts the pieces of the puzzle together because he doesn't even fully get the whole picture, but he was warning us. And boy, when you know that that's true, that God loves us enough to keep speaking to us if we're ready to listen, that really matters. And I'll tell you what, the increase of his peace is without end when you're walking under that governance, when you know that you're hearing the voice of the Lord. That's the main thing I wanted to say. So uh, I'll finish what he said to the disciples, right? He said, what I already quoted is, tell people, when you go and preach, preach the kingdom of God. The kingdom of God is accessible to you here in the earth. It's not just the kingdom of heaven. When you die, you're going to heaven. It's the kingdom of God that's here available to you. And that's why I use the passion. He says, as you go preach this message, heaven's kingdom realm is accessible to you right now. So when we pray for the sick, that's what we're doing. We're tapping into the kingdom realm and saying, Lord, let your kingdom come and your will be done here on the earth because we know you want this person healed. You know the, the demon that's controlling their mind right now and you want to break the hold of that. Make them so strong that the yoke just breaks off. Fill them with so much of your power that whatever's holding them back just breaks off them. In the name of the one I represent, the king's domain, in the name of that king is Jesus. That's where the power comes from, not through us. And then he said, you must continually bring healing to lepers. We might miss a little bit of the, imp the importance of what he's saying because nobody would even touch a leper. So the idea of laying your hands on a leper to see them healed would be way outside the boundaries of thatgrossesmeout.com. See what fear does. Some things are too big for God. No, no, they're not. It says Jesus touched them. I think Jesus didn't just touch them. I think he hugged them. I really do. I'll find out if I'm right or wrong about that someday. But. You're continually to bring healing to lepers and to those who are sick and make it your habit to break off the demonic presence from people and raise the dead back to life, literally and figuratively. I was burned out on drugs, so I can tell you what it feels like to get your brain back. Remember that old commercial, this is your brain and this is your brain on drugs. Frying eggs over here. Ah. And all of a sudden, your mind gets restored and renewed, and you get a will to want to live again, and not just live for your own pleasures, and not just live to fulfill the gratification of your flesh, but to say, no, I want, you gave your life for me. I almost lost my life. I want to give my life to you, Lord. Yeah. Somebody said that to a guy who's ready to commit suicide. The man had stopped on the George Washington, no, I'm sorry, the Golden Gate Bridge of San Francisco, and he was about to jump and he heard a voice say to him, you're about to lose your life. Why don't you give it to me? <laughs> Who was that speaking to him? The Lord. And he went to a Christian that he knew and he said, what do you think that means? And boy, boom, led him right to the Lord, right on the spot. So if you were so ready to give your life away, why don't you give it to him? Watch what happens. Somebody should get happy here, church. Yeah. So make it your habit, Jesus is telling his disciples, to break that demonic presence off of people and to raise the dead back to life. Freely you have received the power of the kingdom, so freely release it to other people. Once you enter a house, speak to the family there and say, God's blessing of peace be upon your house. Does this ever confuse anybody, this little portion of scripture? Like, what do you mean? Let your peace remain on that house, I think is how it says it in the, in the King James Version. It's like when you're in his domain and that governance, remember, of the increase of his government and peace, there's no end. So when you're walking in that domain, your peace is contagious. And you can actually leave a blessing of that peace from you on that house. Remember what he told them too. He said, go two by two. Don't take a lot of money with you because the Lord is going to provide for you. You don't have to over-prepare. Show by the way you operate together as my disciples that I'm with you. So you go into this house and you speak blessing. And if those living there welcome you, let your peace come upon that house. Wow. So you need to have it before you can impart it. 
<laughs> uh, that's not trying to put you on any kind of scale here, but you could see the urgency right now to war for your altar, to war for that time when God is going to be the one that I'm accountable to 100%. I want your governance over my life to increase, Lord. Anywhere I'm not doing that, help me, strengthen me, because there's a hurting world out there. It's very obvious right now because of COVID, but it's always been a hurting world. It's just more obvious right now. People are more aware. And then he finishes. I love this in the Passion. If you are rejected, that blessing of peace will come back on you. Wow, is that cruel of God to do that? I think not, right? Because he's not cruel. He loves us. But I think he's just trying to help them understand you're not always going to see the answer to every prayer. Don't get discouraged by that. If you offer to let your peace be on that house and they reject you, just it'll come back on you and you're going to go to your next stop. But then there's this last really key part of it. It says, when you leave that house, shake off the dust off your feet as a prophetic act that you will not take their defilement with you. Isn't that good? 